until now we have come a long way, but uh, in molecular orbital theory we have learned how to handle only homonuclear diatomics H2 plus H2 F2 so on and so forth. But we do not want to stop there right, we do not want to talk only about homonuclear diatomic molecules, we want to talk about molecules like these which are neither homonuclear nor diatomic. This by the way is calfostin C and what you see here is uh, the output of an energy minimized structure calculated using the quantum chemistry calculation software, computation software uh, GAMIS, uh, it is pretty old now. Uh, th this is uh, from our paper that was published I think in 2000, the work was done in 1999. Uh, the calculation was done to rationalize an experiment that I had performed. The experiment took a day, the calculation took a year using state of the art supercomputer of that time and that is because the molecule is so large. But you can do quantum chemical calculations of molecules that are this large, molecules that are neither homonuclear nor diatomic and you can get useful results like in this one you can see this red one as usual is oxygen, the small white ball is uh, hydrogen. So, we see that this OH hydrogen comes perilously close to another oxygen, there is a hydrogen bond and then that affects this uh, property of this huge molecule in a very very significant manner. So, of course, we will not be able to go all the way where we will know how to calculate, uh, how to do quantum chemical calculations for a molecule like this, but let us see first how do we handle diatomic molecules that are not homonuclear, heteronuclear diatomic molecules and then let us see how do we handle molecules that are uh, not diatomic, how do we handle polyatomic molecules using molecular orbital theory. So, the first uh, heteronuclear diatomic molecule we want to talk about is hydrogen fluoride and here I will take help of some experimental result. The experimental result that I am showing you here is from photoionization spectroscopy and we will have reason to refer to photoionization spectroscopy later on in this discussion. What it does essentially is that it measures ionization energy. Okay. So, what photoionization spectroscopy tells us is that ionization uh, potential ionization energy of hydrogen is 13.6 electron volt we already know this number. For fluorine the smallest ionization energy we get is 18.6 electron volt. So, that would be from the 2p orbital. For HF we get an ionization energy of 13.4 electron volt which is very very close to the value of 13.6 electron volt for hydrogen and we get another one for 18.8 electron volt which is very very close to the ionization energy of fluorine 2p. So, what we understand from this experimental result is that there is one molecular orbital in HF whose energy is very close to that of 1s orbital of hydrogen and we have another orbital whose energy is very close to that of 2p orbital of fluorine. So, uh, when we go ahead and uh, when we do the quantum mechanical treatment we get uh, this expression, uh, the higher energy orbital expression is 0.98 into a uh, wave function of 1s orbital of uh, hydrogen atom plus minus 0 0.19 psi f and for the lo lower energy one it is 0 0.19 psi h plus 0 0.98 psi f these are not normalized so that the sum of coefficients will be 1. So, we have an orbital lower energy that is close to that uh, which is very close in energy and in nature to an orbital of fluorine there is another one that is very close in behavior with an orbital of hydrogen. So, what we see is that unlike homonuclear diatomics we can have molecular orbitals which have greater contribution from one atom or lesser contribution from one atom. So, we can have unequal contribution from the two atoms which leads to as we are going to discuss polar covalent bonds. Again from your high school you would have studied about polar covalent bonds and we know many many examples. Uh, HF, OH in water all these are polar covalent bonds, this is how polar covalent bonds show up in an MOT treatment. And now let me show you the full energy diagram as uh, constructed from molecular vital theory, 
these uh, energies relative energies are more or less ok they are more or less drawn to scale. So, this is the orbital which has energy close to that of hydrogen atom. So, this is mainly like hydrogen uh, 1s orbital. Point to note here is that energy of fluorine is much much lesser than energy of hydrogen uh, fluorine uh, orbitals is much much lesser than the 1s orbital of hydrogen as we had discussed when we talked about homonuclear diatomic molecules of second row. Okay. So, the lowest energy one is mainly fluorine. Okay. Let me go uh, a little further. See what we see here is that we have uh, sigma orbitals that are made up of a linear combination of hydrogen 1s orbital, fluorine 2pz orbital, fluorine 2s orbital. Right? 2pz has the right uh, symmetry uh, in which it can uh, show overlap as we had discussed earlier. So, uh, all these three should contribute to the linear combination, but what happens is that the contribution, contribution comes from square of coefficients, contribution of the fluorine 2s and 2p orbital for these two sigma orbitals, bonding sigma orbitals is much much more than the contribution of the hydrogen atom 1s orbital. And similarly, for this 3 sigma orbital, it is still a linear combination of H1s, F2p, F2s, but contribution of F2p and F2s is really small compared to that of H1s. So, it is a mainly hydrogen atom orbital. Okay. Then you have this 2px and 2py orbitals of F2p which uh, do not have the right symmetry for sigma bonding. So, they are non-bonding orbitals on fluorine. So, the, we call them exclusively fluorine orbitals. Okay. And then uh, how many electrons are there? We have 4 pairs, we fill them in. So, we see that the 2 sigma electrons are mainly on fluorine, they are on hydrogen also, okay. but mainly they behave like their property of uh, fluorine atom. They are distributed in 2s and 2p orbital of fluorine atom to a small extent in uh, the 1s orbital of hydrogen atom. And what about these 2 pairs? These are the lone pairs on fluorine atom. Remember lone pairs, if you just draw uh, Lewis dot structure, you will see that you get 2 lone pairs on fluorine 2p that is what we get in molecular orbital theory as well. The only additional information is that we get to learn that in case of HF these uh, lone, uh, lone pair electrons on fluorine reside in pi orbitals. Okay. So, this is a picture that we get uh, since uh, the electron uh, since there is a more contribution of fluorine orbitals if you draw the electron distribution or constant probability surface you are going to get something like that dull lopsided distribution. In fact, it is more lopsided than what it appears to be in uh, this cartoon. Right? So, unequal contribution from the two atoms is nicely accounted for in heteronuclear diatomic molecules by molecular orbital theory. And what you need to remember is that orbitals must have comparable energy and compatible symmetry so that they can participate in uh, linear combination to form the molecular orbitals. I will say that again uh, atomic orbitals must have uh, energies that are close by to each other and compatible uh, symmetries so that they can participate in the linear combination for constructing the molecular orbital. So, for HF the linear combination involves H1s, F2p and F2s. If you go higher up in the periodic table for HCl well H we have no option it is 1s, but for chlorine now the uh, 3p and 3s orbitals have energy that is close to H1s and that is those are the valence orbitals anyway. So, good thing is you can form this uh, uh, linear combination and you can get energy diagram like this. For bromine now it has become predictable uh, we have 4p orbitals that have energy that is close to that of H1s. All these are drawn roughly to scale and we have shown different things. In this diagram for example, unfortunately I should have cited the source, but I have forgotten where we got it from. But what we see is that we also get to draw the MOs. This is how the MOs will look. You see first of all this uh, sigma bonding MO is formed by combining a 1s orbital and a pz orbital there is a node in pz orbital. So, this is what it will look like do not think it is an sp hybrid orbital or anything it is not it is molecular orbital it is spread over the entire molecule. And for the antibonding orbital what will it be I will just draw the atomic orbitals 
in case there is any difficulty in understanding. In this case for the bonding in interaction this is your 1s orbital of hydrogen atom and this is the 4p orbital of uh, chlorine atom and you might remember that actually we are only showing the outermost lobe inside you have shells right you have plus minus plus like, like that. But all we are talking about is the major shell uh, for further understanding please refer to that uh, lecture where we had drawn these orbitals and we had explained how nodes are and how electron uh, how wave functions are. So, this is the bonding combination of atomic orbitals anti bonding combination would be if you put plus sign here then it will be minus. So, you will have destructive interference here that is how you get a molecular orbital that looks like this you have constructive interference here that is how you get a molecular orbital that looks like this. But please do not forget that uh, your fluorine atom is here and uh, sorry not fluorine what is this bromine, bromine atom is here and hydrogen atom is here all right. So, that is what we get from molecular orbital theory in heteronuclear diatomics we get uh, lopsided molecular orbitals and lopsided electron distribution consequently. Now, we want to talk about carbonyl complexes. So, carbonyl CO carbon monoxide is a very very important molecule from the point of view of chemistry as well as physiology. It is known that carbon monoxide forms uh, uh, carbon monoxide uses this carbon atom as a good sigma donor in formation of coordinate bonds and also it can accept pi electrons are empty d orbitals we say right well maybe uh, d orbitals or what is it uh, no sorry I goofed up a little bit there Th this d orbital is that of the metal from there uh, electron density can actually come back and be accommodated in some orbital of carbon monoxide we will see which orbital. So, back bonding is there this is called synergistic effect in inorganic chemistry. So, that is why carbonyl uh, well carbon monoxide can form very stable strong carbonyl complexes and these complexes has applications in organometallic chemistry like the one that is shown here you take a molecule like this a complex like this oxygen atom lone pair can attack say butyl lithium ok and then this R group butyl group in butyl lithium that gets attached to carbon. Once again carbon here is accepting electron pair and then whatever happens happens. So, the question is why is it that carbon can act as a very good sigma donor and then how is it that it can act as a good pi acceptor also ok. To answer this question uh, we construct a molecular orbital picture. But before that uh, let me also uh, state that uh, carbon monoxide is important physiologically as well because you might know carbon monoxide is a highly poisonous gas. It is highly poisonous gas because it goes and attaches with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin as we know is a carrier protein it transports oxygen and CO2 in blood and the way it does it is that this here is the structure it is a uh, tetramer and it is a metalloprotein it has F, Fe2 plus and uh, there is a ligand which is sort of like porphyrin heme and uh, then uh, this is what happens. In the heme center initially uh, you have a low spin complex so this Fe2 plus actually hovers above the ring and the fifth position is taken up by a distal histidine. Now when from the other side oxygen or CO2 uh, comes and coordinates then it transforms to a low spin complex size becomes smaller and this Fe2 plus goes and fits nicely in the cavity of porphyrin ok. So, that is how it takes up oxygen that is how it takes up carbon dioxide and it can give up oxygen and carbon dioxide easily wherever required that is because these oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin that is these complexes that are formed they are formed reversibly. The problem is carbonyl well carbon monoxide forms carbonyl complexes that are extremely stable the formation is almost irreversible. So, once that complex is formed half life is of several hours. So, if uh, somebody is exposed to carbon monoxide all these uh, or a lot of these uh, hemoglobin uh, molecules will form 
this very very stable carbonyl complex with carbon monoxide which is not going to break so easily. So, they will not be able to participate in oxygen and carbon dioxide transport that is most important for life processes right. So, the question is why does carbon monoxide form such a good complex? Why is it that it can be a good uh, sigma donor from carbon and why can the same carbon atom be a good pi acceptor? Uh, the somewhat contentious uh, uh, molecular vital picture that has been constructed to explain this involves this concept of hybridization that we have uh, discussed already. And here one thing I want to remind you is that it is not necessary that all hybrid orbitals have to be equivalent. They can actually have different energies. It depends on what alpha, beta, gamma, delta coefficients are. Now, with that background, this is the contentious model I was talking about. These are the uh, 2s and 2p orbitals of carbon once again more or less drawn to scale as far as energy is concerned. These are the 2s and 2p orbitals of oxygen. So, in the model that is used remember uh, we know the result already. To explain it we are constructing a model working out the energies and trying to see whether it makes sense. It might make sense to a certain extent and then it might not we will see. So, okay. so the model involves hybridization forming formation of two hybrid orbitals non equivalent hybrid orbitals of two different energies for carbon as well as for oxygen. Okay. So, for carbon H1 is a lower energy hybrid orbital let us say H2 is a higher energy hybrid orbital. Now, hybridization here we are talking about sigma bonds right. So, uh, hybrid, hybrid orbitals accommodate uh, sigma bonds they are used for sigma bonding. So, uh, the p orbital that participates in this hybridization would be pz if we take z to be the direction of approach of the two nuclei. So, px and py do not have the right uh, symmetry as we have discussed earlier. So, they remain non bonding orbitals on carbon okay, right now well should not even say non, non bonding right now they remain uh, in uh, pure unhybridized form on carbon. Similarly, in oxygen you invoke hybridization from H3 and H4 and px and py remain as such. So, now these px and py are actually available for pi bonding we will come to that. Now, herein there is an objection why do we have to use H3 and H4 for oxygen. If you go back to homonuclear diatomics we said that uh, this uh, mixing of sp orbital does not even take place for oxygen. So, why would it take place here? So, one argument is that the CO is uh, isoelectronic with N2 right. If you compare nitrogen uh, oxygen has one electron more carbon has one electron less. So, here even the oxygen atom should behave like carbon atom that is the sort of the argument that is used right. So, now let us try and see uh, which orbitals have comparable energy and appropriate geometry. Do you think H3 will participate in formation of sigma bond? This is the energy of H3 this is in order energy increases right as you go up. H3 has very low energy compared to H1 and H2. So, it is going to remain non bonding. Similarly, H2 has a little high energy compared to H4. So, it will remain non bonding the difference is H3 remains non bonding on oxygen H2 remains non bonding on carbon. What about H1 and H4 their energies are close enough. So, they form a linear combination to give you the bonding sigma orbital and anti bonding sigma star orbital. What about Px and Py now Px and Py are like this these are x orbitals these are y orbitals they can form a pair of pi bonds right. So, you can generate two sets of degenerate pi orbitals and pi star orbitals also. Okay. So, uh, when I write degenerate it is important to understand what I am really saying is this I do not think I talked about this earlier. So, I can write like this I will call it pi x is equal to C 1 P x of carbon plus C 2 P x of oxygen pi y will be C 3 P x of carbon plus C 4 P x of oxygen right. And uh, similarly when you take the anti bonding 
combinations you will have minus instead of plus here and the coefficients are going to change. So, here also symmetry becomes important see p x and p x let us say this is x axis now they are in the right orientation they are the right symmetry to participate in a pi kind of linear combination, but this p x and that p y do not the 2 p y orbitals can participate in linear combination. So, while constructing these pi m o's we do not take p x c plus p x uh, o plus p y c plus p y o we do not do that we only take x's and y's. So, this is how the problem of formulation becomes a little simpler ok. Now, we have to fill in the electrons how many electrons does carbon have 2, 4, 2, 3, 4 right 2 pairs and what about oxygen 2, 4, 6 3 pairs. So, now we have uh, 6 plus 4 10 electrons we will start filling them up in pairs. So, sigma n b the lowest one h 3 is going to have a pair sigma uh, from h 1 and h 4 will have another pair and we have 4 electrons more they will reside in the pi orbitals pi molecular orbitals all right. Is there anything more yes one pair in sigma n b remember sigma n b is a non bonding orbital that is a an uh, exclusive uh, property if you want to put, call it that of carbon atom right it is localized on carbon atom. So, what we see is that this and sigma right sigma means it is going to be highly directional. Now, let me tell you the reason why this hybridization was done is that uh, this is known to be used well this is what we think participates in sigma donation. So, if you want sigma donation to take place you want a highly directional orbital hybrid orbitals are more directional than your p orbitals right. So, that is why uh, this hybridization was used in the first place. So, now this model nicely explains why CO can act as a good sigma donor through the carbon atom because the highest occupied molecular orbital is a non bonding orbital localized on carbon. And why is it that it can accept electrons and remember the di diagram I had shown you earlier when we talk about synergistic effect when we talk about back bonding then this is the diagram I had shown and I had goofed up a little bit this here is a d orbital of the metal ion we drew an orbital on the same carbon car of carbonyl like this this has to be an empty vacant orbital and we said this is how the electron cloud gets transferred. So, this d orbital is filled and the whatever this orbital is is vacant ok. Now, remember this is the sigma bond. So, any orbital that is perpendicular to the sigma bonding orbital what kind of orbital would it be it has to be a pi orbital and I will show you in a minute what these pi star orbitals look like right. So, what we see here is that carbon also has this low lying vacant pi star orbitals which have the right symmetry which enables it to accept any electron cloud that comes back from the uh, central metal atom d orbital. So, this is the orbital that is used in the action of carbon atom to behave like pi acceptor in carbonyl complexes. Now, let me show you the orbitals molecular orbitals and again this is a little contentious uh, what I would like to you to focus on is this sigma n v orbital see it is on carbon heavily on carbon and pointed towards one side it looks like a hybrid orbital and this is the pi star orbital again it is close to the carbon orbitals right carbon p x orbitals. Look at the uh, bonding ones the bonding ones are close to that of oxygen p or p x p y orbitals the anti bonding ones are actually lopsided towards carbon because they have a greater contribution from p x and p y orbitals of uh, your carbon atom ok. That is that this is a model that can nicely rationalize uh, why uh, carbon monoxide is such a good ligand why it forms good sigma bonds to carbon atom and why the same carbon atom 
can efficiently accommodate electron cloud coming back from the central matter atom. That brings us to an end of our discussion of uh, heteronuclear diatomic molecules. In the next class we are going to go back to polyatomic molecules, but this time we are going to learn how one can use molecular orbital theory to understand uh, polyatomic molecules. Thank you.